I'm going to first give you a talk now on heart-lung interactions. <coughs> That's going to be followed tomorrow with a talk on basic principles of, of hair neck monitoring, technical aspects of how you make the measurements, what is a pressure, what is a flow, why do you have them, what is their accuracy. And then the next day we'll talk about functional monitoring, which isn't what you measure, but why you measure it. And then on Friday, we're going to have an audience response in which I'm going to give you cases, real cases, and I'm going to ask you what's wrong with the patient, how do you treat him? And if you don't know the answer, what information do you need to have to be able to figure out what's wrong with the patient? And then we'll put in the data and we'll say, okay, now what do you need? And you'll use the hemodynamic monitoring then as a way of guiding diagnosis and resuscitation, okay? But before we do any of that, we have to understand some fundamental realities, and one of them is called heart-lung interactions. It's obvious that the heart is inside the chest, and the cardiopulmonary unit is a single unit that delivers oxygen to the tissues and removes carbon dioxide, and that the integration of the heart and the lungs together is absolutely central for your survival. The problem is, is that ventilation profoundly alters the circulation, and the circulation profoundly alters the ventilation. So disease of one system alone will hurt the other. So there are a couple of things that you have to understand. The first is that ventilation is a form of cardiovascular stress. Spontaneous ventilation is exercise. It's exercise in every sense of the word. It uses striated muscle, consumes oxygen, and makes CO2. And you can significantly voluntarily increase the amount of ventilation you want to do. Second point is that spontaneous inspiration by decreasing the pressure in the chest will increase both venous return and left ventricular afterload. Whereas positive pressure ventilation does the exact opposite. It will decrease venous return and also decrease left ventricular afterload. And these are the fundamental concepts which we're going to address today, okay? So, cardiorespiratory insufficiency is a firestorm. Patients die rapidly of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, obstructive lung disease, laryngeal spasm. Breathing is exercise. And you and I, the amount of energy it takes for you to breathe is, is almost not measurable. If I were to use a metabolic heart and measure your oxygen consumption, then it puts your mouthpiece on you and have you breathe with the ventilator, I wouldn't be able to tell a difference in the oxygen consumption by baseline because it's just so small. <clears throat> However, when the system gets compromised, either because the system becomes really stiff, as would occur with fibrosis or pulmonary edema, or with abdominal swelling to decrease chest wall compliance, or with restrictive work as occurs with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, or if I have profound decreased efficiency because of increased dead space or shunt, such that I have to ventilate a whole lot more to accomplish the same things, the work of breathing can take up close to 20 to 30 percent of the total oxygen consumption of the body. And just like a person in heart failure who can't walk up two flights of stairs because they have heart failure, that same person may not be able to breathe spontaneously. Unlock the door so that other people can get in. Okay? This was nicely demonstrated by Michel Aubier when he was in Montreal, in which he did a very simple study. All he did was take a, a dog and he put oil into the pericardium to induce tamponade. And he created, therefore, a low output shock state. And he simply measured, as you can see here, the transdiaphragmatic pressure at control after he'd induced the shock state and then at 140 minutes later. You can see that the transdiaphragmatic pressure initially gets really high because in any shock state you have hypertonia, you breathe more. But by 140 minutes in this example, the amount of energy produced by the diaphragm is markedly decreased. Why? Was there not as much neuroactivity? Not at all true. Because if you look at the electrical activity of the diaphragm, it's even more. And if you look at the phrenic nerve telling it to breathe, it's even higher. What's happening is, is the muscle, because it is not getting blood flow, is failing. And what happened at that point in time is the animal had a respiratory arrest. Patients with heart failure die at night 
by stopping breathing. That's why all your condition C's, of heart failure patients are at night. They just give up. Okay. Breathing is exercise no matter what study you look at. The number of studies that have documented that breathing is exercise is almost too numerous to count. However, there are a couple of studies which I really like. The one by Zev Masinifar from UCLA and the one by Mamal Gibran from uh, Martin Tobin's group in Loyola. What Zev Masinifar argued was that if breathing was exercise, then if you could not breathe, then the body should display a circulatory shock. And I should see that other organs should become ischemic. So what he did is he measured the gut mucosal pH using the PCO2 tonometer, which we no longer have. I don't know why the company doesn't make it anymore, but it was a wonderful device. And he looked at patients with chronic obstructive lung disease and measured the tonometered PCO2 and therefore calculated the pH of the gut mucosa. And he argued if you're acidotic, you're in shock. And when he looked at the uh, an initial state of patients who he then weaned and were successful, he found that their pH remained the same. In a group of COPD patients who would subsequently fail but were still on the ventilator at the time he looked at them, he looked at their pH, and it, though it was still in the normal range, it was slightly lower. And furthermore, <clears throat> they became profoundly acidotic during weaning because the gut became ischemic because it had to use all of its energy for the respiratory muscles. It had to clamp down on blood flow elsewhere. Amal Gibran argued that if this is true, this should be the same thing as taking a person and putting them on a treadmill or a bicycle and measuring their mixed venous oxygen saturation. In our pig lab today, we just hemorrhaged an animal and we followed their mixed venous O2 sat and showed that it fell rapidly with decreasing blood flow as the uh, tissues extracted more oxygen because the blood flow wasn't adequate on its own. <clears throat> she argued that if I have a patient who will have weaning success, I will not see a fall in their mixed venous O2 sat as I go on to wean. But if they can't, can't wean because of cardiovascular insufficiency, their O2 sat will fall. And as you can see, the patients who failed had profound uh, desaturations down to 50%. The reason why all of our hemodynamic monitoring predictive parameters are terrible is because none of them assess cardiovascular reserve. That's why we're stuck with the totally nihilistic approach of doing a spontaneous breathing trial. Because we're saying, we have no idea if you can do any well, so we're going to throw you in the water and see if you drowned. If you don't drown, you can swim. If you can't drown, ah, pick you up. Well, we'll see if we'll drown tomorrow. <laughs> that is what we do, in case you didn't know. And furthermore, what you could see in the failure patients was their oxygen extraction they went from less than 25% to almost 40% oxygen extraction of the tissues, which is what you do in heart failure with exercise. Okay. Potentially, therefore, the reason why weaning parameters are so inadequate at predicting cardiovascular success and weaning success is because they do not identify cardiovascular reserve. It has been hypothesized by several people, including myself, that the primary cause of failure to wean from mechanical ventilation is cardiovascular insufficiency relative to the work of breathing needed. Since you can rarely improve cardiovascular function, the primary job is to decrease the work of breathing by increasing bronchodilation, decreasing the stiffness of lungs, improving the efficiency of gas exchange, and if that all fails, give dobutamine. This is the big fish. <laughs> Well, if it is exercise, then you can use it as a stress test, right? You can put a person on it. And the number of studies that have shown that weaning is a cardiovascular stress test, again, is far too numerous to show. But my favorite one is that by um, Francois Lemaire from Paris, who back in 1988, when I was on my sabbatical in Brussels, um, with Jean-Louis Vincent, he was there working with a guy named Warren Zapel. We got together a couple times for dinner. It was nice. And he looked at, he argued that in fact, if the reason that patients fail to wean, they should have marked demonstration of cardiovascular insufficiency. So he looked at the data, and this is, a, this is the original slide of his presentation at the ATS of his abstract. 
Afterwards, I came up and said that was good. He took his carousel of slides out and handed me that slide because it was my suggestion to do the study. So you're looking at the original data. Let me just walk through you. This is a single human being at baseline, five minutes of spontaneous breathing, and at nine minutes of spontaneous breathing. And this is a person with chronic obstructive lung disease that was stable and everybody thought could be weaned. He put an esophageal balloon in to measure changes in pleural pressure measured as esophageal pressure, and he measured pulmonary reocclusion pressure and heart rate. The esophageal pressure is shown as a top line, and relative to its zero numbers, you can see that the value before in exhalation under baseline conditions is about two or three, which is normal because when you're lying supine, the heart sits on top of the esophagus and your pleural pressure there is slightly positive. Whereas if you were to sit up, like stand up, if we are now, that same pressure would be like minus two, which is where it should be. The pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, as you can see, is approximately 18 and there's a spontaneous inspiration and a positive pressure breath, trigger positive pressure. So I would say that the pulmonary occlusion pressure in this patient is about 18, and the uh, patient is breathing fine, happy, and they want to try a weaning trial. So they put the person on a T-tube, and five minutes into the T-tube breathing, look what happens to the esophageal pressure. The end expiratory esophageal pressure becomes more negative. It goes from about four down to zero. And this is probably due to two things. One, expiratory breaking so that the lungs are bigger. But look at the profound negative swings in intrathoracic pressure. This person's really fighting to breathe. But the background pressure is zero and minus. Look at the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. The values are about 42. Now I'm going to tell you tomorrow that pulmonary occlusion pressure is an inaccurate measure of left ventricular performance, but it's a darn good measure of capillary pressure for pulmonary edema. And trust me, 42 millimeters of mercury for pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is very high. At nine minutes, it's up to over 50, and there's agonal respirations. And I asked Dr. Lemire at the very end, what is this funny blotch at that point? He says, well, that's when we put the patient back on the ventilator because they would have died otherwise. Said in another way, it's not subtle. When you do a spontaneous breathing trial, you'll see immediately that the patient doesn't work. So what it really is, is not weaning, but it's liberation from spontaneous breathing, <clears throat> ventilation. Now let's switch from exercise to talking about the effects of lung volume and intrathoracic pressure. The effects of ventilation occur on the circulation, obviously, and the effects of circulation occurs in the ventilation. We already saw that if you're in heart failure, you stop breathing. Similarly, if you have left ventricular failure, you have pulmonary edema and then paired gas exchange. That's straightforward. But what about the effects of ventilation on the circulation? That can be thought of within two ways. One is that with every breath, tidal volume changes, and thus there'll be changes in lung volume. <clears throat> and they must occur. And secondly, the changes in lung volume require a change in intrathoracic pressure for those lung volume changes to occur. Thus, the hemodynamic differences between positive pressure and spontaneous breathing aren't due to changes in lung volume because lung volume changes in both. It has to be due to the changes in intrathoracic pressure and the energy necessary to produce those changes. Having said that, the changes in lung volume are profoundly important and need to be looked at first. The lung is richly innervated with autonomic nervous system receptors, both afferent and efferent. They are both parasympathetic and sympathetic. What we normally see is that with spontaneous inspiration of a normal tidal volume, which is less than 10 mLs per kilogram, we have parasympathetic withdrawal and you get cardiac acceleration. And you know that as respiratory sinus arrhythmia. But if you have really large tidal volumes, you also get sympathetic withdrawal, and that causes myocardial depression. The second effect of changes in lung volume are is that they alter systemic vascular resistance. And finally, if the lung volume gets too big, the heart gets compressed within the cardiac fossa, and this causes mechanical heart-lung interactions. If we looked at autonomic tone first, Small tidal volumes cause this cardiac acceleration, and this was described by ANRAP years ago, and it's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And you see it in your patients. Importantly, the, la the presence of it connotes normal autonomic tone, and its absence denotes autonomic neuropathy. 
uh, Luciano Bernardi from Pavia, when he was a fellow here in my lab, studied this in great detail back in the 80s. And based on that, this is now a standard test done in all diabetic clinics. They simply have a person sit down for about 15 minutes while they have a PLETS signal on their finger to measure the heart rate, and they look for heart rate variability. If there's no heart rate variability, they know their diabetic control is terrible. If there's good heart rate variability, they know they have good autonomic tone, and it's much better than the uh, hemoglobin C1A, okay? And it's, it's free. Interestingly, we also showed in another study that if we took human beings with heart transplant, in which they're totally denervated, there still is a slight degree <coughs> of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, one hundredth that seen under normal conditions. And this almost assuredly represents the fact that with inspiration, you're increasing the volume in the ventricle and the atria, and it just takes a little bit longer for the heart to contract. But most of the respiratory sinus arrhythmia is totally due to autonomic tone. Unfortunately, with large tidal volumes, you get inflation and vasodilation, which is easy to show in anyone who's on cardiopulmonary bypass in the OR. Take any patient you've got on bypass and just inflate the lungs. You'll, even though the cardiac output remains constant because they're on bypass, blood pressure will immediately fall. It's really easy to show. It's associated with cardiac depression, and it's most commonly seen in neonates who are put on high-frequency ventilation. The major problem that neonatologists have with putting patients on ventilators is their kids all become hypotensive, and it's due to this reflex vasodilation. It can be blocked by giving sympathetomimetic agents. Well, inflation-induced humoral stresses also occur, and what ends up happening is, is with inflation you get a release of uh, cyclooxygenase responsive agents that cause both vasodilation and negative inotropy. And if you simply give um, ibuprofen to people, it goes away. So there's a profound autonomic and from the smooth muscle um, uh, cyclooxygenase limited um, lipid mediated vasodilation, which is seen within mechanical ventilation. Now let's switch from the effects on autonomic tone, which are very important, to talk about pulmonary vascular resistance. If I take your muscle and squeeze it down and raise it, the resistance to flow to it will also rise and fall as intertissue pressure goes up and down. But if I simply take your muscle and passively move it back and forth, there'll be no change in resistance. So the resistance has nothing to do with what you did with the muscle's length. It has to do with the tissue pressure inside it. Is that point clear? Okay. So the same is true of the lung. The lung pulmonary vascular resistance can be changed by two processes. One is by active changes in tone, Al alveolar, big A, O2, and pH, by a process called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and by mechanical compression of the vasculature, which has been shown almost uh, 50 years ago. And finally, autonomic tone. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is an interesting concept. <laughs> you, as you sit here right now, your pulmonary vasculature is actively vasodilated you are essentially releasing nitric oxide. It's like you get a nitroprusside infusion continuously. You are actively releasing nitric oxide right now into your pulmonary circulation from your pulmonary arterioles. And this is keeping that whole area vasodilated. And it works on constitutive nitric oxide synthetase that's always there, but it requires oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, the constitutive nitric oxide synthetase cannot work and you don't put out the nitric oxide and you don't have the nitric oxide induced vasodilation. So it keeps your pulmonary input impedance really, really low, but it requires oxygen. So it means that the oxygen goes away, you vasoconstrict. You're not really vasoconstricting, you're just going back to your normal resting vasomotor tone. <coughs> the second thing that happens is an active vasoconstriction which is due to an NAD, NADH dependent voltage gated calcium channel. Remember I told you before that all smooth muscle contraction is dependent on calcium availability? Well, it's no change in the lungs as well. It's just that in the lungs and in the kidney, the two organs where when you're ischemic you don't want blood flow, they have a specific NAD, NADH gated channel that opens up when you don't have energy to allow calcium in to cause constriction. 
And it's the combination of those two things that cause the increase in vasomotor tone. Hope you come back later. It's unfortunate. I, that's right. Importantly, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction occurs below an alveolar PO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury or with metabolic acidosis. Thus, if you're at high altitude, you'll have hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, even if you're a totally healthy person. Or if you're breathing in low oxygen into a part of the lung because you have a tumor in one area of the lung, so that you're not ventilating that lung, it's O2 sat will fall. Now, has anyone here ever seen a person with drowned lung? You know, one lung that's totally, uh, totally closed and filled up as occurs with people with main stem bronchial cancer? They walk into clinic. They're not feeling good, but their entire lung is, is totally filled. They're not hypoxemic. Why? Because hypoxic vasoconstriction has decreased the blood flow to that lung, and all the blood is going to the other lung where the ventilation is. All right? Is this so, a reversible phenomenon? Yes. If you exercise the person or give them a nitrate, you'll kill them. How about in pathological states where you have babies that have um, right to left shift? and then they experience an Asimengus complex. Does it reverse? Yes, it will. So the molecular basis of the oxygen sensing is to the NAD NADH uh, receptor here is shown nicely in a review article in the New England Journal. So it's in the New England Journal, it has to be true. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is good because it allows local vasoconstriction to be matched with local hypoperfusion <coughs> so that you have maximum sh uh, ventilation perfusion matching. So an area of the lung that you're not ventilating is not going to be perfused. What a great mechanism, and that's why it exists. It matches regional perfusion and ventilation. But it also can be bad because you have global hypoxia. As occurs in asthmatics, for example, you'll get massive vasoconstriction and pulmonary hypertension. And this also is the primary cause of high altitude pulmonary edema seen uh, in mountain climbers. Well, what are the. You see the same thing in uh, sleep apnea? Yes, you see the same thing in sleep apnea. That's correct. Uh, but it also in sleep apnea, the hypoxia also impairs myocardial contractility too. So it's a slightly more complex thing, and that's the cause of heart failure in obstructive sleep apnea patients. And I'll get to that at the very end of my talk. When you think about your pulmonary blood vessels, they live in two different neighborhoods. The large pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins, they sense it as their surrounding pressure, the interstitial or pleural pressure. But the smaller pulmonary arterioles and venules and the capillaries, they have as their surrounding pressure the alveoli. So we call the vessels that sense as their surrounding pressure alveoli as alveolar vessels, and all the rest is extra alveolar vessels. The Alveolar vessels, therefore, have as their sensing outside pressure, alveolar pressure, and the extra alveolar pressure, pleural pressure. Why does this matter? Well, what is the difference between alveolar and pleural pressure? What is that called? The alveolar to pleural pressure gradient is called the transpulmonary pressure. That is the distending pressure of the lung. The only way I can increase lung volume is to increase alveolar pressure more than pleural pressure, right? And the only way I can decrease lung volume is if the two get smaller. The pressure gradient determines distension of the lung. The pressure gradient and the compliance of the lung are the only two determinants of lung volume. So there exists, outside of the blood vessel, an extramural pressure gradient that progressively gets bigger and smaller as inspiration and expiration occurs. Are you with me? If the transpulmonary pressure exceeds pulmonary artery pressure, the blood vessels will spontaneously collapse as they enter the alveoli, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. I have just described to you West Zone 2 without ever mentioning alve left atrial pressure. So if we were to look at pulmonary vascular resistance in the y axis versus lung volume from residual volume to functional residual capacity all the way up to total lung capacity, we see that in all people, it's a U-safe curve where the lowest pulmonary vascular resistance we have is at our resting lung volume, functional residual capacity. However, as our lung volumes get smaller, pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. And as our lung volumes get bigger, pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. But the reasons they do are different. 
if you were to look at the alveolar pressure, the lung volume is going to be as small as you want. <clears throat> it won't change your alveolar resistance. They don't have any smooth muscle tone. They're just alveolar vessels, right? They're, they, they're capillaries. But as the lung volume gets progressively bigger, the transpulmonary pressure gets progressively bigger, and the vessels get collapsed, collapsed down. And thus, the major cause of the increase in pulmonary vascular resistance with increases in lung volume is increases in alveolar resistance. Whereas with the extra alveolar vessels at really lung volume, just like the airways are held open really big at really lung volume, the blood vessels are held open because of the radial force is pulling them open. But as the lungs get smaller and smaller, the terminal airways collapse down as you get towards residual volume, and the hypoxia that it's associated with induces hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Thus, a person in acute respiratory failure who's going to have small lung volumes, their pulmonary vascular resistance will fall as you increase lung volume. But a person with COPD who's hyperinflated, their pulmonary vascular resistance will fall if you decrease lung volume. So will PEEP increase or decrease pulmonary vascular resistance? The answer is yes. Decreases in lung volume below FRC were nicely shown by Hakeem many years ago to be due to hypoxic vasoconstriction. And Roy Brower subsequently showed that increases above FRC caused the increase in um, capillary resistance. So these are the papers that documented what I just told you. <clears throat> Is this important? Absolutely. COPD patients, I think I was, here's rounding at the VA, you know what I'm talking about. They all, when they come in, the chronic obstructive lung disease patients, they all come in hyperinflated and in right heart failure. Well. The only thing that positive inexpiratory pressure, otherwise known as PEEP, does is increase lung volume and indexalation by increasing your transpulmonary pressure. It makes your alveolar pressure larger. It doesn't affect pleural pressure primarily, only secondarily. And therefore, it must increase inexpiratory transpulmonary pressure and will therefore increase lung volume proportional to lung compliance. Yes? I mean, this is, a, this is not a question. This is a true statement. Therefore, the dynamic effects of PEEP only occur if the lung volume increases. If lung volume doesn't change whatsoever, I can give you 100 centimeters of water PEEP, and I'll see no effect whatsoever on your cardiovascular system. If you don't believe me, anybody here is scuba diver? I am. Anyone else? You guys go in and have a good life. <laughs> scuba diving is fun, by the way. Every 10 meters down is one atmosphere. 760 millimeters of mercury. If you're 33 feet down, which is 10 meters, and I'm sitting there bubbling away, fat and dumb and happy, my alveolar pressure is not zero. My alveolar pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, or 820 centimeters of water. Am I dead? No. Is my pulmonary vascular resistance high? No. Why? Because my pleural pressure is 762. And the difference between the two shows that the transpulmonary pressure hasn't changed. Well, Canada, from the late Dr. Bill Sibyl's group, did a really neat study years ago. They took a, a dog model and they caused acute lung injury to one lung but not the other. And they all had the same pulmonary artery pressure by definition, because it's the same body. And they all drained into the same left <laughs> atrial pressure, okay? So they measured flow into both lungs and they selectively increased PEEP to one lung and leave the other lung alone, or vice versa. And they looked at the effects of PEEP on pulmonary vascular resistance. They measured a lot of things, but this is my favorite picture. So what we have is we have 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20 centimeters of water PEEP. We had a control lung and a lung with acute lung injury induced by oleic acid infusion into the trachea on that side. What they found was that if they looked at the acute lung injury lung, its pulmonary vascular resistance at baseline was really high, much higher than you'd expect. As they gave PEEP, the pulmonary vascular resistance decreased and stayed low up to 10. This was most assuredly due to reversing hypoxic vasoconstriction, probably by opening up collapsed lung units, you know, recruitment, right? And then as they went from 10 to 15, it went up a bit, and 15 to 20, it rose. What happened when they did the exact same thing on the healthy lung in the same, same animals, and half the animals they had the left lung and half the animals had the right lung as the injured one, so they could switch them around. What they found was that 
at low lung z, z, the pulmonary vascular resistance of the healthy lung was half that of the disease lung, of course. They're healthy lungs. And as they gave a little bit of PEEP, there was a minuscule, in their case not statistically significant, in my study it was significant, but I'm not showing you our data. This is probably just a little bit of opening of microatelectasis that occurs. And this is the reason why you can give with impunity five centimeters of water PEEP to every single ventilated patient you've got, even those with COPD. Go ahead and do it. Standard. Just do it. It'll prevent microatelectasis. And then, of course, as they increased the amount of PEEP they gave the lungs, there was increasing hyperinflation and increases in pulmonary vascular resistance. But look, there was nothing special about acute lung injury or normal lungs. Once both lungs had been recruited, any further increase in lung volume increased pulmonary vascular resistance the same in both lungs. Thus, the goal of giving PEEP, since we know we're going to have healthy lung and injured lung, is to get the maximal recruitment without increases in pulmonary vascular resistance. Peter Suter years ago told us that that probably occurs at the maximal cardiac output that you'd get for any given level of PEEP. And so you increase the PEEP until the maximal oxygen delivery and cardiac output occur. And if you go any higher, the pulmonary vascular resistance makes cardiac output fall. How much should that be? That depends on each patient and also then that patient is in their disease process. Well, finally, the heart lives in this cardiac fossa here. And as lung volumes increase, the chest wall can go up, the diaphragm can descend, but the heart is trapped in the cardiac fossa, and it cannot leave. And thus, we see that increasing lung volume compresses the heart, decreasing biventricular filling, making both ventricles small, quite analogous to tamponade. This was nicely shown in a study in a case report from uh, Seattle years ago. I forgot to put the reference down in which they looked at inspiration versus expiration at zero and 10 centimeters of water peep. And you can see that although inspiration is a slightly smaller uh, heart than expiration, look at the difference in the size of the heart with 10 of peep. And this is the same patient. This is just adding 10 of peep and doing it, okay? There's, it's a physical tamponade effect, okay? Since all those effects can be explained by the changes in intrathoracic pressure, we're now gonna switch from changes in lung volume to changes in intrathoracic pressure. And for you to understand how changes in intrathoracic pressure alter cardiovascular function, you have to accept the following hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the heart is in the chest. <laughs> Do you accept that hypothesis? Good. The heart is in the chest, a pressure chamber inside a pressure chamber and thus increases or decreases in intrathoracic pressure must affect the pressure gradient for venous return to the heart and left ventricular ejection from the heart independent of the heart itself. Okay, it's as simple as that. So, one of the problems we have is what if you have a patient like this, which is one of mine, you can see they have an endotracheal tube in and they obviously have a diffuse interstitial pattern. This was a patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome, but you wanna ask the question, how much is that PEEP, or airway pressure, going to be altering pleural pressure because it's the pleural pressure that's the intrathoracic pressure that you care about. There was this rule of thumb that said that 40% of the airway pressure was transmitted to the pleural space. And back when I was a fellow, that's what everybody said. But was that true? Well, Jacques Romain, when he was a fellow with us years ago, uh, 15, 16 years ago, did a series of studies in dogs in which we caught acute, induced acute lung injury, and this is just one of his studies on that. And you can see here is yellow is the transpulmonary pressure versus static lung volume. As we progressively increase the lung volume, you can see that the transpulmonary pressure increased. We then increased acute, uh, acute lung injury by giving a lake acid infusion and then waiting about a half an hour so you had nice stiff lungs, they were bloody and hypertensive, etc. And then as we did the same increase in lung volume, you can see that the transpulmonary pressure was higher. And you would say to me, well, Dr. Pensky, of course. You know, you have stick lungs, you have ARDS. What are you showing me? But instead of looking at transpulmonary pressure, if you looked only at the pleural pressure itself, you would see for the exact same increase in lung volume, pleural pressure rose the same. If you have no altered chest wall compliance, the only determinant of the increase in pleural pressure will be the increase in lung volume. And thus, if you give a pressure-limited uh, ventilation that gives a decrease in tidal volume, 
as you uh, have stiffer lungs, you'll actually see less heart-lung interactions. Whereas if you give volume-limited um, positive pressure breathing and allow the pressure to rise, you'll see significant heart-lung interactions. And that was the argument that John Marini and Neil McIntyre made this week in the latest issue of the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in their pro-con debate, if you want to read it. Okay. So we wanted to know how much pericardial or pleural pressure would increase if we added PEEP. So years ago when I was on my first sabbatical in Brussels uh, with Jean-Louis Vincent and uh, the surgeon Jean-Marie de Cement, we went into the operating room and I put a pericardial balloon catheter into the heart overseeing the left ventricle on a series of patients. And when they came back from the OR, we progressively increased them from zero to five to 10 to 15 centimeters of PEEP and back down to zero. You with me? And as you can see, and every patient here is color-coded differently so you can see them all the same. Yeah, as you increase PEEP, the increase in mean pericardial pressure progressively increased, but look at the variance amongst patients. One patient went from minus three to zero, whereas one patient went from minus three to five. That's a change of eight. So just having the same increase in air, airway pressure from zero to 15 made one go up by three millimeters of mercury and another go up by eight millimeters of mercury. So knowing the increase in airway pressure alone will not tell you the increase in pleural pressure. Tomorrow, I will show you how with Jean-Louis Taboul from Paris on my second sabbatical there, we, we created a system that allows you today to calculate the true transpulmonary pressure. And by the way, the technique I'll show you tomorrow is all, every year on the boards in critical care medicine. So I'm just warning you ahead of time, it's something that you're gonna have to know because it's a formula they can test you on. Okay, what is the relationship between airway pressure and intrathoracic pressure? If you have increased airway resistance, your end inspiratory pressure will overestimate the true pleural pressure, but your end expiratory pressure will hide the hyperinflation. The mean pressure will probably be the same. If you have stiff lungs, then even then for the same tidal volume, there'll be, uh, I mean, for the same airway pressure, your uh, intrathoracic pressure will decrease less. If you have really compliant lungs, as in COPD, the slightest increase in airway pressure will profoundly increase intrathoracic pressure. And if you make the chest wall stiff, then for the same slight increase in lung volume, pleural pressure will go up a lot. So let's look at how now changes in intrathoracic pressure will affect the pressure gradients for venous return and left ventricular ejection. I think you all remember my lecture on venous return, the effect of circulating blood volume. So if I look at right atrial pressure and I increase it, I look at what happens to blood flow from the left ventricle, I would get this left ventricular function curve. But remember what I told you, that there's also a venous return curve that says as you increase right atrial pressure, that's gonna act as a dam to venous return, and that in you and I, there exists one and only <coughs> one point, which is your equilibrium point, remember that? You and I have one and only one right atrial pressure and cardiac output, which is a function of our ventricular function curve, and blood volume, blood volume distribution. Okay, well since the heart is in the chest, increases and decreases in intrathoracic pressure will artifactually shift the left ventricular function curve back and forth like this relative to the venous return curve. So, let me prove it to you. In 1984, in our lab, using dogs, I split open the chest, put a flow probe on the pulmonary artery, closed up the chest, had the animals recover, and during spontaneous breathing, you can see pleural pressure fell, there was a slight decrease in CVP, causing an increase in venous return, right ventricular filling pressure rose, and there was an increase in right ventricular stroke volume. See that? We'll contrast that to a positive pressure breath where you made the airway pressure positive, made the pleural pressure rise as lung volume increased, CVP went up, and because of that, that's a damned venous return, right ventricular filling falls and right ventricular stroke volume decreases. So I'm showing you that as CVP goes down, cardiac output went up. And as CVP went up, cardiac output went down due to positive pressure breathing. So if this is my normal condition, and what I do is I simply have a spontaneous inspiration, boom. I'm gonna see the CVP go down, but the cardiac output go up. Just as I said, as I swing my 
venous, my left ventricular function curved to the left equal to millimeter per millimeter equal to the fall in intrathoracic pressure. There'll be no change in ventricular function and my cardiac output will go up and that is referred to as the thoracic pump and that's why spontaneous breathing has a slightly higher cardiac output than apnea. And that's also why in heart failure, the very first thing that patients do is they become hypertonic. Think about it though for a second. If that's the case, either an immediate pneumothorax or opening a thoracotomy will abolish the negative swings and in intrathoracic pressure, and I will see an immediate fall in venous return, which is true. Decreases in pressure the gradient would immediately occur because the right atrial pressure will be decoupled. Okay, and as my lung volumes then get smaller, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction will increase pulmonary vascular resistance, and that's why people who come in with a pneumothorax are often in cardiovascular compromise. They're not getting the venous return, and they're in right ventricular failure, and they didn't have to have anything wrong with them beforehand. So this is a pretty slide. This is the effects of spontaneous efforts, including the obstructed breath. At these points here, we have a spontaneous breath, as you can see, spontaneous breath, pleural pressure falls, causes the right atrial pressure to rise a little bit. There's no change in airway pressure. But at this point in the middle, I stick my finger on the trach tube, and I get a boom, a Mueller maneuver. And you can tell it's a Mueller maneuver because the fall in pleural pressure is equal exactly to the fall in airway pressure because there's no change in lung volume. The transpulmonary pressure remains constant. But look, with the profound decrease in CVP, there's a massive flooding of blood into the right ventricle. This is the cause of the volume overload with obstructive sleep apnea. So with obstructive sleep apnea, when you have a negative effort, you're going to markedly increase right ventricular volume. If it's persistent, you have pulmonary hypertension. And you also have a hypoxia. So you have an ischemic heart that's pumping against an excessive pressure and you're volume overloading the right ventricle. And that's the reason why patients with obstructive sleep apnea go on to develop heart failure. And that's also why giving them nasal CPAP reverses heart failure in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. So, we showed years ago when I was at Johns Hopkins that in heart failure patients immediately upon getting heart failure, this was actually during an angioplasty, so it's kind of a form of heart failure, um, they have an immediate depth of uh, ventilation. Loaded spontaneous inspirations by sucking in the blood cause pulmonary edema. Inspiratory impedance, where you push down on the chest and then you put your hand on the endotracheal tube just for half a second and then allow it going to make the pressure negative for just a half a second can double cardiac output during CPR. Okay. Some people have actually suggested that if you can't resuscitate the person in the field, strangle them. Let them breathe against obstructed breaths because it'll increase cardiac output. I do not recommend that you do that. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about why we don't want to have a right ventricle getting really big. And the reason is mainly because of ventricular independence, which says the volume of one ventricle, if it dilates up, makes the left ventricle stiffer. That was nicely shown by Taylor et al. years ago, which they showed if you take the heart and cut it in half, the right ventricle looks like an afterthought. Left ventricle is like a nice concentric American football that Ben Roethlisberger might throw around. But if the right ventricle dilates up, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that you're going to be shifting the septum over to the left and making the left ventricle stiffer. It'll be stiffer, but it won't have a change in wall stress. <clears throat> so it's not using Starling's mechanism to change volume, so cardiac output goes right down. To show that nicely, Taylor did a study in which in a totally dead animal, they progressed, they looked at the filling of the left ventricle and its filling pressure, and they say had no volume in the right ventricle. And then they progressively increased the amount of volume in the right ventricle. And what they found was, as the right ventricle got bigger and bigger, the left ventricle got stiffer and stiffer. But let's think about that for a second. You're the poor fellow on call, and you have a patient in the ICU, and he's got a PA catheter in, and he's starting to go into poor pulmonary, and the nurse calls you because their wedge pressure which had been 15 with a normal cardiac output. Their wedge pressure is now 20. Their cardiac output's half what it was before. They're tachycardic and they have no urine output. And you say, my God, they've gone into heart failure. Well, they may have, or they may just be in core pulmonary. 
because as you can see, for the same volume, if you're stiffer, I need a significantly higher filling pressure. And so if you take an echocardiogram of that patient and saw that in fact the left ventricle is collapsing on inspiration with massive paradoxical septal shift, you would say this is acute cork pulmonale. The treatment of this is not volume. The treatment is either to decrease the PEEP because they are in far too much PEEP or improve contractility by increasing coronary blood flow. Bell from Obotham's group looked at this as well, and what she did is he took crystals and put them in the heart so that you had an anterior, posterior, septal, and lateral. And he looked at the effects of expiration versus inspiration. You can see that with spontaneous inspiration, the septal free wall got smaller, and the opposite occurred with the uh, anterior, posterior. So the heart basically squeezes in with every breath. Okay? So what are the effects of ventilation on the right and left ventricular outputs? This is pa a paper I published about uh, 25 years ago now. And this is continuous recording of right ventricular stroke volume, left ventricular stroke volume, aortic pressure, left atrial pulmonary and right atrial transmural pressures, airway, pleural, and right atrial pressure. This is a spontaneous breath, and these are positive pressure breaths. As you can see with the spontaneous breath, pleural pressure falls, causes an immediate increase in right ventricular stroke volume, and an immediate proportional fall in left ventricular stroke volume. You see that? This goes up and this immediately falls at the exact same time. What is that? What is that? Causes paradoxes. No, it's pulse of paradoxes. But what causes the left ventricular stroke volume to fall identical to the increase in right ventricular stroke volume rising? That, my friends, is ventricular interdependence. That's the right ventricle getting bigger, making the left ventricle stiffer, so it gets less volume and it can pump out. With positive pressure breathing, we see a fall in left ventricular stroke volume, but almost no fall in the right, I mean right ventricular stroke. The left ventricle only falls much later, after three or four beats, when the blood flow that was decreased to the left, right ventricle finally made it over to the left. That's minimal heart-lung interactions. And that's the reason why in two days from now, I'm gonna tell you you can use pulse pressure and stroke volume variation to identify volume response in this only during positive pressure breathing not during spontaneous breathing. So now let's take a look at the effects of what happens with positive pressure breathing. As we increase intrathoracic pressure, we see that the CVP goes up, but that the cardiac output goes down. So what's gonna happen? You intubate a patient, and you see their CVP goes up, but their cardiac output goes down. What are you gonna do? You can extubate them. But chances are you put the tube in for a reason. So what you do is you give them volume, right? And when you do that, you create a new venous return curve. CVP goes up even longer, and you smile, and you say, they're fine. You're right. But watch, now you want to extubate this person. As soon as you extubate them, if they're volume overload, they'll do like Francois Lemaire's patient, and their pulmonary artery occlusion pressure will go up to 40. That's why you always fluid restrict patients prior to extubation, because every patient, when you decrease intrathoracic pressure, will increase their intrathoracic blood volume and you're gonna give them the equivalent of a fluid resuscitation bowl simply by having them breathe spontaneously, okay? Guyton described this in 1957, in which he said the primary effect of changes in lung volume and intrathoracic pressure on the cardiovascular function is to alter right ventricular filling, intrathoracic blood volume, and ultimately left ventricular preload by increasing CVP, which is the downstream pressure to venous return. Well, if this is true, Eugene Braunwald, back when he had hair, and demonstrated that if you just give fluid resuscitation or give aramine, which is his norepinephrine equivalent, you could increase cardiac output in animals given PEEP. His study was pretty neat. He took a dog and put him on a teeter-totter with its head at one end and the business end at the other. And he had it balanced, <clears throat> and he measured cardiac output. And then he gave the animal PEEP. You with me? And what he found was the feet got heavy and the head got light and the cardiac output fell. He then gave aramine. Cardiac output came back to normal and the animal balanced. Such a pretty elegant study showing that he was able to transfer fluid from the central to the peripheral compartment back and forth. You know, that it's not ambiguous. It's just gravity. You, can, you cannot fake that experiment. So pretty. You know, we do all this fancy stuff. He did it that way. Cornon, the Nobel laureate, studying this during World War II, 
demonstrated that if he gave patients positive pre uh, vent pilots positive pressure ventilation when they were up at high altitude uh, on oxygen, that they would often black out. Not something you want to do if you're a pilot. Okay. And he found that they couldn't give them positive pressure. They just had to give them the oxygen at the mouth because the positive pressure decreased venous return. So, if I have this increase in pressure, why doesn't every patient I give PEEP to or intubate, why don't they crash? Well, the answer is half of them do, but the other half don't. And the reason they don't is they're fluid resuscitated to begin with. And as they are fluid resuscitated, was you give the PEEP and you increase their intrathoracic volume and the diaphragm descend, you pressurize the abdomen. As the belly pressurizes, you increase intra-abdominal pressure from this diaphragmatic descent. And this causes an, a slight shift of the venous return curve to the right, such that even though you have a slight decrease in cardiac output, it's not half of what you thought it was. And we showed that in a study in human beings uh, with uh, Paul Vandenberg back in 2002. And André Verabron, Antoine Verabron, uh, in 2003, finally validated that what we showed in dogs 20 years ago was also true in humans. He used echo and showed that with positive pressure breathing, there is a decrease in aortic blood, pulmonary artery blood flow, and three le beats later, there's a decrease in aortic blood flow. So what I showed you in dogs is also true in humans, as you can see. So Andre Deneau, when he was here, he looked at the pressure volume loops of the left ventricle and showed that during positive pressure breathing, look at how positive pressure breathing collapses down the left ventricle. One can think of it like a whale moving through a sound. Positive pressure breathing, the volume of the ventricle gets bigger and smaller. And in fact, in a paper that's coming out this month in intensive care medicine, Jaime Mesquada and uh, Youngu Kim demonstrated that if you look at the pulse pressure and the stroke volume, of the left ventricle. They always fall right after the positive pressure breath and come as the volume goes further. And if you were to simply take the difference between the right ventricular stroke volume and the left ventricular stroke volume, and if there's more blood going out than coming in, the total intrathoracic blood volume is decreasing. If there's more blood coming in than going out, intrathoracic blood volume is rising. And what they did is they measured this by heartbeat <coughs> in animals as we increase the amount of tidal volume from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20. And you can see that in all animals, and this is true of humans too, with positive pressure inspiration, you decrease your intrathoracic blood volume and it comes back in exhalation. And this occurs in your patients as well. And it's the reason why you see the pulses paradoxus and it's the reason why you see the stroke volume variation. Now let's talk about the effects of uh, intrathoracic pressure on left ventricular ejection. And for this, I have to show you my children. Um, nobody seems to understand transpulmonary pressure, so I prefer to show you a picture of my children instead. You'll understand it after you see this picture. Okay, trust me. This is uh, Stephanie, Daniel, and Jill. Their transpulmonary pressure is the amount of their height, which is above the surface of water. Do you care how tall my kids are? or how high above the surface their heads are. Their height above the surface is their transpulmonary pressure. So their real heights may be whatever, but their heights above the water is their transpulmonary pressure. So I don't care what arterial pressure is, I care what arterial pressure is relative to pleural pressure, right? So for the same arterial pressure, if the pleural pressure is positive, I've got very little arterial pressure. If the pleural pressure is negative, I've got very high arterial pressure, right? You follow? And if Jill stood on a rock, she'd look taller than the rest. So back in 1975 with Andy Buddha, we did a study in which we looked at the effects of negative swings in intrathoracic pressure on left ventricular function in humans. What we did is we had them do a Mueller maneuver, which is to inspire against an occluded airway. And we made their pressure minus 50. Now watch. If my arterial pressure is 50 and I've got zero pleural pressure, the transpulmonary pressure, the transmural pressure of the heart is 150, yes? If I make the pleural pressure in here minus 50 and I keep the arterial pressure at 150, then the gradient across this is 150 minus a minus 50 or 200. 
That's the exact same thing as if I'd given a phenylephrine infusion to make the arterial pressure 200, right? So negative swings in intrathoracic pressure should increase left ventricular afterload. And that's exactly what we saw. The, the right ventricular, the end diastolic volumes, the end systolic volumes all rose, ejection fraction fell within one heartbeat of the obstructed left leg. This is the, some of the, this is the equivalent of obstructive apnea. The systolic pressure didn't change, but the transmural systolic pressure rose. Subsequently, <clears throat> numerous studies have shown that negative swings in intrathoracic pressure induce acute left heart failure. Why do you think you get so upset with a person with in inspiratory wheezing? Because the harder they breathe in, the more the vocal cords come together and the higher the negative swings in pressure, and they rapidly, within seconds, can go into pulmonary edema and die. Inspiratory wheezing is the thing that scares you more than anything else. Okay. Decreases in intrathoracic pressure will increase left ventricular afterload. We showed that in our New England Journal paper. But then we subsequently show that if you increase intrathoracic pressure, that would augment the left ventricle. And that's basically the principle that, yeah, you'll be shifting the curve to the left, but if you improve contractility by decreasing afterload, you'll actually see cardiac output go up. Does that happen? Yes. This is an example of a, a dog with severe heart failure in which we use high-frequency jet ventilation so the tidal volume didn't increase. We progressively increase pleural pressure and airway pressure by binding the chest and abdomen. And as we did, as you see, intrathoracic blood volume decreases because as you increase intrathoracic pressure, you decrease the amount of blood in the chest. That doesn't change. I haven't changed the world. But look, the stroke volume actually went up because you'd afterloaded the heart. This is no underload, after, decreased afterload. This is no difference than giving nitroprusside to a person in severe heart failure. If I were to give you nitroprusside, what would happen to your cardiac output? It would go down. You'd crash. You're not at all afterload limited. You're preload limited. But if I give a severe heart failure patient nitroprusside, their cardiac output often goes up. What happens if I give them a whole lot of nitroprusside? Their cardiac output too will go down eventually, because eventually as the preload falls, they won't do well. Okay. Well, we showed that an acute heart failure induced by beta blockading dogs increases in intrathoracic pressure, increased cardiac output. And then we showed that in patients that were cardiomyopaths, it worked. And then we found that if we can increase the pressure in cardiac cycle specific fashion in heart failure dogs, we could selectively increase cardiac output. And George Matushak showed that he could prevent the fall in cardiac output with hemorrhage. And then Keith Stein showed that we could prevent mitral regurg. Increases in intrathoracic pressure decrease left ventricular afterload. Thus, increases in intrathoracic pressure will have different effects on your patient depending on their contractility. If they're normal, you're not worried about that. You're um, preload pre dependent, not afterload dependent. And if you have plenty of volume on board, you could care less. That's why I can take a patient with severe heart failure and intubate them and give them 15 a piece just like that. Don't even think about it. And they do well. Whereas if I gave a normal person 15 a peep right away, their cardiac output would crash. <clears throat> and that has to do with whether you're preload or afterload dependent. So if that's true, the hypothesis is any relative increase in intrathoracic pressure will decrease left ventricular afterload. And this is where obstructive sleep apnea comes in. If I can abolish the negative swings in intrathoracic pressure, I'll take away the negative afterload effects without having any decrease in venous return because I haven't made the pressure positive. And the number of studies that have shown that CPAP and BiPAP decrease cardiovascular stress are too numerous to count. As a matter of fact, the American Society of Emergency Medicine now says that the initial treatment for cardiogenic pulmonary edema is CPAP. The initial treatment, not secondary. The very first thing you do is put them on CPAP. The very, you know why? Because in less than five seconds, they're getting better. Period. Okay. Okay. We're gonna stop now. I'm just gonna show you some of this data. I'm not gonna take it to the final point. But Radisson showed that in patients with acute myocardial infarction, the benefit only occurred when you abolish the negative swings in intrathoracic pressure. And furthermore, if you did that as opposed to just giving oxygen, you improved oxygenation here shown by the black lines, respiratory rate decreased, 
And not only did you have less time with intubation, they live longer. And if this was your mother, would you rather have them in this group or that? Okay. I think I prefer that. At this point, I'll stop. But what I was going to show you, and I'm not, is that if you were looking at the myocardial oxygen consumption, just like uh, I showed before in my lecture in left ventricular performance, if I, make the, if I take away negative swings in intrathoracic pressure, I also decrease myocardial oxygen demand by taking away the pressure needed. And thus, one of the advantages of giving that mass CPAP to the person with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema is you decrease the myocardial energy needs in a person with coronary artery disease. And that's the second benefit of it. Okay?